fast money. You know, it, it might work once or twice, but in the long run, it just doesn't work. Every taxi driver, my personal trainer would talk about me showing how much money he made every day, and then all of a sudden it stopped and I never heard about it again. It, it is a slow grind, right? It takes years to, to accumulate significant wealth. You gotta, it's slow and steady, and you know, uh, that's how you build it up. The team we've built is really important. So we've grown the business and we've had a really intense focus on who comes into the business. What's your secret to maintaining competitive advantage? What we do differently to quite a few of our larger competitors is... Private markets investments are investors can find some real value. I find the best way to learn is learn from someone who's done it before and given it a go. Hi, I'm Travis Miller, host of Grow Your Wealth podcast. Thanks for joining me here today. On these podcast sessions, we're gonna talk through how uh, certain investors have navigated the bumpy road of investing, whether it be through business or investments in general. Thanks for listening today. Welcome to the Grow Your Wealth podcast, where we dive into the strategies and insights to help you build your financial future. I'm your host, Travis Miller, and today we have a special guest whose expertise in real estate investment is unparalleled. Joining us is Jason Hulich, a titan in the real estate industry with an impressive 27-year career that spans across various sectors, including commercial and industrial real estate. Jason's role as joint CEO of Centuria Capital Group and his leadership in several other Centuria entities, including Centuria Life, Centuria Healthcare, and Centuria Property Funds, mark him as a key figure in the industry. But what truly sets Jason apart in his position as joint CEO alongside John McBain, where they oversee an outstanding $21 billion in assets under management across Australia and New Zealand. Whether you're a seasoned investor or just starting out, Jason's experience and knowledge are invaluable for anyone looking to expand their portfolio and understand the dynamics of the real estate market. So sit back, tune in and get ready to unlock the secrets of real estate investment with one of the industry's most influential figures, Jason Hulich. Welcome, Jason, to Grow Your Wealth Podcast. Thanks, Travis. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you making time. So we're going to start out fairly simple, start at the beginning. Can you give us a potted summary of who you are and what you're currently doing at Centuria? Yeah, sure. So um, um, I'm the joint CEO at Centuria. So I moved over from New Zealand um, when, just after university when I was 21. So I've been in Australia nearly 28 years now. Um, yeah, we started Centuria. We had our 25th anniversary uh, in September. So it's been going a long way. Solid, it's been, yeah. been, been, a, been a journey. Um, and as you said, yeah, now we're sort of an ASX 200 listed um, real estate fund manager with, yeah, just over 20 odd billion of, of assets under management. Gotcha. What brought, what made the move to Australia? Yeah, it was interesting. So I finished uni and um, my old man had a share in a small development company over here. And he said to me, oh, do you want to move over for a year and learn development? And the, his partner was an old school developer and um, there's only five or six people in the office and... I said, I'll go for you. I didn't know anyone over here, um, had no mates here, uh, but I thought I'd give it a go. Um, so I moved over and I started working for them for a few months. And then you know, I was the youngest in there by 20 years. It was really hard for me to meet anyone. You know, there wasn't much for me to do. So I said to the old man, I'm going to actually go out and find a job where I can go and meet some younger people. And, gotcha. and uh, yeah, so I left there and, 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 and got a job and that was probably the start of the, the journey. Yeah, it's good. Interesting when talking to people, you got that the, the the student life, the business life, and the social life. Is if you go through it, the social side of things, you mentioned you didn't meet many people. Mm. Is so the mates you met in the early days has that been important to your career? Yeah, look, back in New Zealand, like most of my mates, I was at school with, like primary school with. So I've yep. got a lot of mates I've known since I was four or five years old, which is great. And I still go back and see them a lot, um, and a lot of actually quite a few of them are uh, involved in the real estate sector. And we actually bought a, a New Zealand, the, the largest unlisted platform um, during COVID, actually about three years ago. And um, it was actually started and it was listed. It was started by a guy I went to school with, yeah. a good mate of mine too. So, you know, I, I think I get to it, but, you know, that whole, your contacts, your relationships, your networking, you know, it's obviously you want a strong social side of things, but also mm. I think it flows through to your business side as well. Yeah, for sure. I think particularly in real estate as well. Yeah, it's a very yeah. Yeah, relationship-based sector. For sure. Yeah. Now, why did you launch um, Centuria Funds Management, which was the, sorry, Century Funds yeah. Management, which was the precursor Centuria, and what was the problem you were solving? Yeah, look, it's a, it's a funny story. It's a little bit by accident. So when I left, my dad sort of 
um, JV, um, I went to work for a guy, John McBain and his business partner, and they had a company then called Hanover Property Group. And what it was, was sorting out problem real estate after the 90s crash. So early 90s, massive real estate crash in Australia. A um, lot of, you know, developers and uh, property owners went under. Huge vacancy at interest rates at 18%. So the sector had a lot of tough times. So John and his business partner set up this consultancy to try and sort out problem property for the owners or for the banks. Gotcha. So before a bank went MIP, they'd call Hanover in to try and lease up the building and sell it or finish off a half-built industrial development, things like that. Um, so we were doing that. So I came in just as a junior guy helping them do that. And we had a lot of clients. But back then, you didn't really have REITs. It was all yeah. the insurance companies um, that we were dealing with, a few privates and then the banks. Um, it was really interesting work, you know, because there was so much, um, there were so many issues out of the, that 90s crash. And then um, John uh, sort of split with his partner. I went with him and said, let's build up the consulting company. And one of our first jobs, so um, a lot of people know Greg Goodman. He owns, yep, uh, runs sure. Goodman, which is the biggest, one of the biggest industrial fund managers in the world. So $80 billion of assets. And at the time it was called Goodman Hardy and two Kiwis, Greg Goodman and Duncan Hardy, um, owned it and they'd set it up back then. They probably had a hundred million dollars of mm -hmm. assets, which was reasonable oh, size back yeah. in the you know mid nineties. Um, and they were Kiwis. So we'd on a Friday, we'd go around to their office, have a beer. Anyway, we'd just gone out together on this new sort of consultancy. And, um, they said, look, we might have a job for you. We own a little shopping center out West in Minchinbury, which is out towards, you know, Penrith, Blacktown out that way. Yep. Um, and it's, um, it needs some work, it needs to be leased up and we want to sell it. And so probably as a favor, they said, here's a job, go do it. So it was a tough gig. It was an older style asset. Um, it was two story walk up, you know, brown mm -hmm. brick with the car park in the <laughs> middle. Gotcha. Like the, the, you know, the, probably the only known tenant in the whole thing was Blue Haven Pools. Um, other than that, it was just, you know, no brands. So we leased it up and then it came time to sell it. Anyway, we took it to the market and we got one bid and it was from a accountant out of Brisbane and he wanted to do a small high net worth syndicate around it. And, um, he'd never done one, yep. but he wanted to do one. He was, he was our, our only buyer. So, um, you know, there's a big fee riding on it for us. So we thought, no, let's give him a good you know, hand and try and induce him to people, help him write his IM. Um, so off we went. So between the, you know, we were helping him along the, the way to raise this money. Um, and came time for him to go unconditional on the contract, hadn't raised the equity. Mm. Um, so he came back for an extension. So we went and saw, um, Duncan and Greg said, oh, we need another, he wants another month or two. They said, fine, you know, keep helping him, you know, try and get him there. So two months later, came back, still didn't raise the equity. Yeah, went back, got another month. Yeah. Anyway, another month went by and he hadn't raised it. So we go in and we said, look, he wants another month. They said, we're not giving it to him. Mm -hmm. They said, he's had three extensions. It's ridiculous. So he, they said, look, you got a dollar. And John put out a dollar. Out to him. Back then you had a few yeah. coins in your pocket. And um, he said, you've got a three month option. You're doing half the work. You go do it yourselves. And, um, so that was the, so we had to raise $3 million. It was a $9 million purchase. It was returning 14%. It was back in the day where you get, you got tax free. So it was 180% tax free. So all your income from the property was mm. tax effective. And then you got another, another 80% of you know, other income. So, um, we went out, we had to raise $3 million. Uh, it was bloody hard. We used every day of the three months, but we got <laughs> there. Um, and that was our first fund back in, yeah, that was 1998. Gotcha. Yeah. Solid. Yeah. I mean, that's how a lot of businesses start, right? Yeah. You got to scrap. That's right. Raising three millions hard. Yeah. It was bloody hard now. Yeah. And then you look at, you know, some days we might, you know, go into the listed markets, raise a few hundred million overnight. Yeah. It's, it's, it's been a big change. Everyone starts somewhere though, right? That's right. Good on you. And we talk about Centuria. Like what's your secret to maintaining competitive advantage? Yeah. Look, I think there's a few things. Um, I think. The team we've built is really important, you know, cause we started, you know, we started back in the day, it was John and I, John's wife was the accountant yeah. and a receptionist basically, and a property manager. So there's basically yeah. five of us and, you know, we've now got 430 people, um, you know, we've picked each one. So we've grown the business and we've had a really intense focus on who comes into the business. You don't always get it right, but even now, like even for the most junior roles, either John and I will be the final interview just to try and make sure it's a good fit. Um, so yeah, we've built this fantastic team. It's been a really, um, stable team. Um, one of the co cool things I think we did in the GFC. So in the GFC, obviously you hit property pretty hard and you saw every property company was just 
sacking whole whole yeah. floors of people, right? Yeah. We didn't have a big team there. We might have had 30 people, but still it was hurting us. And I remember talking to John and I said, what do, we, what do we do? You know, and he's like, look, this won't last forever. You know, and, and when it turns, if we've, you know, if we've got rid of half the people, mm -hmm. it's going to take a long time to build back up. So yeah. we went to everyone and said, we called a, a meeting and everyone thought that the ax was going to fall. And we said, look, we don't want to get rid of anyone. Right. Yeah. And all their friends were getting fired left, right and center around the industry. We said, what, what we want to do is if, if, we want to do something different. If you if you've got a salary above one hundred twenty thousand, we want to cut it by ten percent. If it's under that, it might be five percent. You'll make that up in options in the company. That's good. Um, and you get an extra week of leave, and hopefully it's only twelve months or so. And John and I took you know a more a higher percentage, and everyone, everyone was relieved because everyone thought you know everyone, everyone's going to be fired. Mm -hmm. So what it meant was when it did turn all the other property companies had, had to rebuild and we were ready to go. And that's when we got a lot of growth coming out of the GFC. So I think one thing's the team. And part of that is also what we do differently to quite a few of our larger competitors is um, our, what we call our property services division. So we do everything from the facilities management. So having that guy on site that looks after the lifts and the air con and talks yep. to the tenants about the issues through the property managers, to asset managers, leasing and development and everything gotcha. else. But a lot of our peers would have the asset manager and up. So gotcha. that outsource the facilities management, property management to a Jones Lang or a CBRE or something like that. And, you know, it's not a big profit driver, but what it does, it means you've got the direct mm. relationship with the tenant. So if he likes the building, doesn't like the building, needs less space, more space, you know, you're hearing firsthand, you're not hearing for, through an agent. Yep. And I think it means we get better property outcomes. So we get better retention, um, it would get better tenant satisfaction and those sorts of things. So I think that really does help us with our portfolio. You know, we've got, a, we've got 430 buildings. We've got two and a half thousand tenants across the, the portfolio. Enormous. Yeah. Massive business. And so back to the decision on the staff yeah. and the GFC. So did that create a bit of loyalty with the team? I think? think so, definitely. And yeah. look, it's amazing. You know, we've got, um, you know, we have awards and things as you get through year yeah. five, 10, 15. And, you know, we've had our first couple of 20 year We've got quite a few 15 years in the last two years, plenty of 10 years. So, yeah. um, it's been a, yeah, it's been great. And you look at, at the team and if you look at the, you know, the senior guys, the top yeah. 30, you know, we've probably had two people leave in the last seven years and they both just left recently for, you know, they got really high, um, yeah. you know, senior roles in other companies, which we couldn't really give them. But, um, yeah, we've had really good, stable, loyal, yeah. um, team of yeah. people. Amazing decision, right, during that job. I was in banking in yeah. those days, right, and it was carnage. And you sort of – it's one of those as an entrepreneur, which you were, it's kind of a bit of a risk and return, right? Like yeah. you're thinking of – obviously you're thinking of the personal side of it with your staff, but it's a risk, right? You're mm. probably paying out greater in salaries than your competitors. Yeah. But by taking risk and it's calculated, you've looked after your staff and the return, it sounds like, came in that post period. Yeah, it so was it's good. sort of a solid decision. It was. And I think because, you know, especially John being 20 years older than me, he'd been through a few cycles before I had. And he was like, look, it always seems, you know, darkest mm. just before dawn. And, you know, it, it will turn. And when it turns, you know, it turns reasonably quickly. So, um, yeah, it was really it was a smart decision at the time. Definitely. Good on you. Let's take a step back now away from, you know, Centurial mm -hmm. world is, um, take us through your, obviously your Kiwi, New yep. Zealander, uh, talk us through your early life and career journey. Yeah, sure. So I yeah, grew up in Auckland in New Zealand, um, uh, one of four, um, parents, so I'm sort of my grand, both grandparents on both sides were immigrants out. So Croatian and Lebanese, mm -hmm. um, you know, great grandfather came out as a child and great grandmother, they got sent out as you know, five-year-olds basically wow. when there was yeah. no money back then in the uh, sort of late 1800s, not early 1900s. Um, I think he was a stonemason building churches and things back in the day. Um, and then, yeah, so, um, the old man got into, um, food. So meat, yeah. you know, like a primo, like a gotcha. small primo. Yep. So, um, bacon, ham, small goods. Start off with one small bankrupt butchery that he bought, uh, bought out of uni and sort of built it up into a, quite a big, um, you know, listed company and sold out in the end. Great. And, um, yeah, so I went through, um, school in Auckland, went to Auckland university. Um, and yeah, dad had invested some bit of dough into this development company in Sydney and hence the, the move across. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please subscribe on whatever platform you're using. It helps us build a community. We want to educate investors and this is what it's all about. So what have you enjoyed doing the most? Um, 
I think when you're an entrepreneur and it's, it's the building the business and building the mm. team, you know, yeah. um, especially after, you know, I've been doing it for a long time now. Um, and, and funds management is something is where you can really measure that growth, right? And there's headline Absolutely. AUM and, yeah. and when you're a fund manager, that that's what drives profitability and scale, scale drives profitability. Um, so yeah, you can see, I remember with John, we got to a hundred million dollars of, um, assets under management and we thought we were massive and yeah. had a big lunch to celebrate and, you know, and, uh, I still remember that back then. And, um, and then it just, I was looking at the graph the other day we did for our 25 year anniversary and you look at it and it just, it's just bubbling along, you know, hundred, mm. 150 over the years. And then you start, you know, ramping up and getting scale yeah. and then it just really moves. So growing, growing the business has been fun. It's been, yeah. you know, you have your ups and downs definitely. Um, and then the team side of it, at, you know, same thing, growing from five people to 430. Um, and just watching these p people come through and the superstars come through from being a, you know, coming in as a junior analyst and then, yeah. you know, running big parts of the business and the growth of those people. And, you know, as you get older, you look at, you know, who's, you know, who'll be taken over down the track. And so that's, that's been a really enjoyable part gotcha. of it. On that funds growth, um, you know, was it, was there a tipping point? Some of you said it was, it's always progressive. Yeah. Is there a point you can, uh, you can look at and say that was the tipping point or was it just grind yeah, and then? I think, um. If you go back to 2017, so look, we had two, God, probably two or three billion under management. So not, you know, six years ago, um, we had mostly done for the last 10 years office. Yeah. So up till 2014, we're basically unlisted office, um, mainly high net worth investors yep. in syndicates, basically. Um, in 2004, well, go back to 2006, we sold the business actually. We sold the business. So just before the GFC, we had, um, all these groups coming to us wanting to buy us. Now we were about 420 million, gotcha. which was a reasonable size for, for a syndication company back then. So we had all co Valad, a lot of names that yeah, blew up in the GFC. Yeah. So luckily we didn't sell to them, but then we got approached by Rothschild. Mm. And they came to us and they said, look, we're looking at getting back into real estate in Australia. We like your high net worth brand. And we like to put the Rothschild on a, on a, you know, I am, that'd be pretty good. Yeah, so we started going down that track. And anyway, we got a phone call, uh, from the MD. And he goes, look, we just got a call from Europe and they're pulling us out of, of Sydney on the, on the real estate side. So we can't do the deal. And I'm like, okay. He goes, but one of our investment banking clients is looking for a property platform. And, uh, and we said, oh, who are they? And they said, well, they're a friendly society out of Melbourne. And we, we said, well, it's a friendly society to start. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so pretty quickly we did this deal with this group out of Melbourne. They weren't property. They were a friendly society that demutualized and listed. Um, they were in reverse mortgages and bond, investment bonds and financial planning and um, white label insurance and things like that. And they wanted a property platform. So um, we we sold them to them. Um, it didn't work out that well. Sort of a year, within a year, we knew that we probably made a mistake. They were doing a lot of very high risk lending, yeah. um, leading into the GFC. Um, so we sort of had a bit of a bust up with them at the time. And we said, look, you've got to change some things you're doing because you're going to blow up the country company. Um, and they said, no. And in the end, we, we put a resolution up at the AGM to sack the whole board. <laughs> and we had a big proxy fight. We won it and sacked the whole board on the day which was you know, something we'd never done. <laughs> it's not that, you know, not that common enlisted land. So we, we took over this a year later, so this is 2007, we took over the business. Um, they had 30 of these loans out to developers, um, in very secondary locations and very yeah. average developments. Um, GFC was hitting. Um, so that was hard. Like we nearly went to the wire. We had to spend, we spent the next probably three years tidying those up, you know, JVing with builders to finish them off, selling them where we could. And any one of the big ones could have sent us under, but we sort of worked away. And luckily we had all that experience from dealing with the problem property. Yeah. We're, we're well suited to fix it. So we did that and we, we got out of there and we sold off all the non-core businesses. So we kept property and we kept the bond business. Yep. Anyway, so we kept going, but we're listed now, but we're tiny. We're like a $50 million market cap. And, um, all the analysts we'd go talk to and they wouldn't have much interest. They didn't understand that unlisted business. They like yeah. REITs, right? So we got to 2014 and they wouldn't even cover us. So we got to 2014 and we're like, we need a REIT, like, you know, just at least so, so they would show some interest in us. So we had a small little unlisted fund that had a few properties in it and we said, okay, well let's, we'll try and list that. So, um, 
we end up listing that and it was called uh, Centuria Metropolitan REIT at the time. That was Metropolitan, mainly office assets. Gotcha. And, um, and that was 2014. So we kept building that up and then doing unlisted office. And then 17, we did a M&A deal. We bought a thing called 360 Capitals, yeah, um, Tony that. Pitt's yep. property platform. And they had a small office REIT. They had a small industrial, well, bigger industrial REIT and a f- four unlisted funds, basically. Yep. And that came out of the Beckton when Beckton sort of blew up. We took some of the funds and he'd taken some of the funds and listed them. Um, so we bought that bit, that platform and, and, um, we merged the, um, office read into ours and then we had yeah. this industrial read and that sort of started our diversification sort of strategy. Mm. Um, and then from there we thought, you know, we we'll probably, you know, by that stage we we're about an 80 mil market cap and it was a $150 million deal. So it was a big deal. Um, and the IBs really supported us, we got it off the ground, we raised the dough, um, and that sort of started the growth. So then next business we bought was a healthcare real estate yep. manager, Heathley. Yep. So that, that got us into healthcare. Um, then we bought, um, business in New Zealand, mm. which got us into, um, obviously different geography, but also got us into some retail assets as well. And some tourism assets. Um, we then brought prime West, which is a five, yeah, was a $5 yep. billion dollar manager out of Western Australia. And that got us into ag as well. Yeah, sort of. And then the final piece of the puzzle was um, we bought 50% of uh, a company called Bass, which we were just yep. talking about, which is uh, real estate credit, so non-bank lending. So what it did was took us from just being office to a really diversified platform of, you know, seven, basically seven sectors. And that really supercharged that growth of AUM. Yeah, it's interesting. Mm. I actually grew up in a town called Warrigal. Oh, yeah. And uh, I noticed an enormous tomato uh, greenhouse you guys have bought. Looks like a pretty interesting business. Yeah. So, so when we bought the Prime West business, they had about a hundred million dollars of ag assets. And, um, when we, when we brought them in, we're like, you know, we think there's a really good opportunity around ag. There wasn't a lot of people in that space and yep. in, in our, in, in our sector. And, and we thought we wanted to scale. Mm-hmm. So the, the original, um, assets in the, the fund were, um, some vineyards, some almond farms, um, a salary farm. And, um, we started looking at ag, doing quite a bit of work around it and looking at, you know, what's the top of the pyramid, like the most tech, most, the larger assets that aren't just big, you know, farms and the like. And we started looking at these glass houses and, um, you know, people would think you look at a glass house, it's a pretty basic piece mm. of kit, but these things are now highly technical and the IP from the operators is incredible. And that was the first one we bought. So it was a $180 million purchase, a big asset. Um, it's 33 hectares under glass. So it's the biggest glass house in Australia to put in perspective, it's eight MCGs under yeah, glass, enormous, yeah. right? So it's big. And uh, there's, there's, so since then we've bought three more, um, uh, with the largest owner of those large scale glass houses in, in Australia. And it's, it's a, it's a new sector f- mm. yeah, for, for me and for a lot of the guys. And we had to, we had to learn a lot about it. Um, but it's incredible, especially around the whole ESG and, um, you know, this, this protective farming. So, um, obviously, you know, you're not as exposed to elements as, yeah. as you would be outside. Um, you know, in, in one square meter in the field, you, you grow about, you know, three and a half kilos of tomatoes a year in the glass house per square meter, you grow 85 kilos, wow. right? So you can grow all year round, you can grow up, you can, you know, there's a lot of things you can do to, to really help with your yield. Um, so most of these glass houses do grow tomatoes, but then they're now doing, uh, cucumbers, capsicums, things like that. But it's, it's definitely the, um, you know, it's definitely the, the way forward and, you know, yeah. some parts of farming. You know, we bought one down in Port Augusta that, um, you know, the tech in that's incredible. It's got its own desal plant. So it pumps water from the Gulf all the way to the plant in the middle of the desert. Um, it's got a 18,000 mirror farm computerized that tracks the sun, concentrates all the energy and the heat from the sun onto a, Graphite sphere, 130 meters up on a tower that heats a turbine that runs the desal plant gotcha. that then can water the glass house. Yeah. So yeah, they're pretty amazing pretty assets. Smart. These things, yeah. Yeah, I mean that's really interesting about your business and impressive is it's multi-sector property, right? So yeah. you're diversified across the sectors and investors. They've got that opportunity to access different buckets of risk across the whole property segment. It, yeah, it's, it's two things. It's, it's one, it gives our investors a choice yep. um, and also it diversifies the platform. You know, if we were just office now, you know, the office, the office uh, portfolio is in good shape, right? Yeah. We've got three or four percent vacancy, 
but we wouldn't be growing much, right? At least right now we've got investors that are interested in ag or interested Mm. in credit or healthcare when they're not interested in some of the traditional asset classes. For sure. Very good. Now, uh, top three people who have influenced you across your career. Um, two would be my parents. Dad definitely, you know, he started a business from scratch, came from nothing. Um, I remember as a kid, like he was never at school, (laughs) sports or anything like that, but every morning he'd be up at quarter past four to go turn on the smokers for the bacon and work really hard. So I think from him it was the work ethic and, you know, um, what you get from that hard work and probably the the ethical side of business. Um, and then mum, probably the softer side, so kindness and generosity and things like that, treating how you treat people, all that sort of stuff. And then John, who's you know, my joint CEO now, but I worked for him for, you know, 20 years basically before we were joint CEOs. Yeah. And um, so I went, you know, I was 21 year old, straight out of uni, didn't have a clue. So he sort of taught me everything along the way, just about, not just about real estate, but business. And um, again, how you treat people, how you treat the agents, which we were talking yeah. about before, things like that. So they'd, they'd be the, the top gotcha. three. And on that uh, business partner, like you and John, obviously been for a long journey. Mm. How did that go? Did you have any days or weeks or months when you were blueing or oh, debating we, on topics? Never, or? Look, we've never had a arg- proper argument ever, gotcha. so, which is which is good. Um, we Look, there's things that we have different views on. Yep. Um, and look, usually it's got to be unanimous or we do something. Well, it always got to be unanimous or we do something. Um but yeah, it's sort of, it's weird. It's like, he's 20 years older, but it just sort of works. Yeah. I think, I think if we were both the same age, it probably wouldn't work because yeah, it's yeah. you're too, you know, at least you're removed a bit in age. So, um, you know, I became joint CEO about five years ago. Yeah. Um, so I was sort of running real estate and funds management for years and, that, and then John sort of time's right for us to, yeah. to do it. So yeah, it was good. It was a great decision for me from, on, you know, whether he made to do that, yeah. didn't have to do that. Um, but it's a good team. We split the business. You know, it's really clear what he does, what I do. So he's more corporate yeah, gotcha. finance, that sort of stuff. And then I'm more, I'm all, re- all the real estate, all the funds gotcha. management and that. I mean, the success of the business means you obviously the two of you have, have got a lot right. It's yeah. interesting. And you talk to people about starting business. It's yeah. like picking your partner and picking your founders and your yeah. colleagues is a tough one in the early days. So you got to put a lot into it, but no, obviously definitely. You, you see a lot, blow up, right. right? Yeah. Correct. You've had a varied career and you've already touched on some mm. of these things, but what's the biggest shift you've made in your career that brought you where you are today? Um, look, the one shift, like it's hard because I've basically done the same thing for 27 years, right? Yeah, yeah. But the big, the big shift for us and, and allowed us to scale was the list being listed, yeah. right? So, you know, being listed is not ideal all the time. It's hard work and you've got, you know, lots of analysts to report, you know, you got to report yeah. into six times a year and you got, you know, thousands of True. investors and all that. And there's a yeah. lot of governance and compliance and you got ASIC and APRA and all these things. Um, but you know, it does allow you to scale up, you know, yeah. you can go out, you know, if it's our REITs or if it's our head stock, if we've got a good idea, if we want to buy someone or do something, you know, and the market's right, we can go out and overnight raise 200, 300, 400 million dollars. And you know, you can get these step changes in your size, which yeah. You can't, it's a lot harder to do as a private company, right? Yeah. So I think that's probably the one that's allowed us to go from there to there. Gotcha. What I like is that first three million you made. Yeah. You, sorry that you the capital you raised. I know from our business, that first capital raise, you got no brand, no yeah. reputation, you don't have any contacts, but you know you've probably got a good asset. Getting on the road's tough. That's right. So, it's just wearing out shoe leather, right? It's yeah. just getting in front of people. Yeah. It's hard, but it's um, it's it's funny even now. And our capital raises, we're never, we're always a bit nervous, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And these days it might be 50 or a hundred or 150 million, but you're never quite sure. Yeah. You've still got that nervousness from, you know, from back then. Yeah. Capital raising is oh. never easy. That's right. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying this episode. If you want to learn more about alternative assets, there's a book here you can read, How You Grow Your Wealth with Alternative Assets. Now back to the episode. Okay. So you've got a lot right during your career. Mm. Do you want to give us a couple of times when you know, bumps in the road, when it didn't yeah. work out as you expected? Look, it's, um... Especially in real estate, it's very cyclical, right? So you know every 10 years or so, something's going to happen you know, globally, macro, that, that you know, makes it difficult. Um, so, look, I've been through a few, like .com was there, but it didn't really affect real estate that much. Um, but then, obviously, GFC was hard, and then um, you know, COVID, and then yeah. really what we're in now, too. So, 
Um, so th there's always, there's always twists and turns in real estate. Um, you know, GFC has definitely been the hardest, uh, in my career, that period. Um, what you had there was you had that liquidity squeeze from the banks yeah. and you haven't, you don't have that now. Um, the banks are there and, you know, they think playing nice and the money's there if you're, if you're, if there's someone that, you know, that you've got a good relationship with. Um, so that was really hard. You know, you had, you know, the banks, um, with the big listed guys and the big dilutive equity raises mm. coming through, you know, we had, um, you know, back then, you know, our business was all unlisted. So it was a lot of single asset funds, um, and, you know, we had, you know, you had vowels coming off a lot, you know, you had vowels dropping 25, 30% in that market. And, you know, it was, it was some of the hard, we were quite lucky because we had sort of a high net worth investor base. Yep. Um, it allowed us a bit more flexibility. So, you know, there's two things coming from a, um, coming from a business that was concentrated on single asset deals yep. is quite different to a, let's say a REIT or a big portfolio, right? Every asset's got to stand on itself or you, sure. if you blow up that asset, you've blown up that fund, right? Yep. So you got, it's very asset specific. You've got to be so careful about the risks about that particular asset. If it's in a portfolio of 30 assets, one goes bad, one goes really well, it, it balances itself out. Um, so one, we had to, you know, you know, we had these single asset funds. So we're quite lucky. Like we got close on um, breach and covenants a few times, gotcha. mainly on, on your LVR covenant. And back then, if you look at pre-GFC, most unlisted managers were quite, you know, they were geared probably at 60%, mm. which now sounds silly, but most yeah. were geared at 60% and they might have a covenant of 65%, right? So you didn't have much buffer there. Yeah. We probably had two or three funds, um, you know, out of the 40 that got close to breaching. And we're quite lucky because we had maybe 20, 30, 40 investors and they're all, you know, wholesale investors. Yeah. You know, we'd go back to them before when it looked like it could go, it could breach and we'd say, look, we don't want to breach. Uh, we need an extra three or four million dollars. Um, you know, what we want to do is um, give everyone the right to come in. Um, you, it could come in as, usually we did a mess piece or something. Yeah. Um, you got 10% on your money paid before normal distributions and then um, distributions got paid after that. Gotcha. And on those three situations, they, they came in, they, you know, we, we, got, we provided a rational argument why we mm -hmm. needed to do it. That came in, we paid it down so we didn't breach and off we went. Yeah. But, uh, you know, still, I remember every day there was something went wrong in the, during the GFC and I'd be walking down to John's office and he'd like, what now? Yeah. Like, this has happened or this has happened or this tenant's gone or this yeah. has happened. So, but that's where you definitely learn the most, right? Like yeah. I learned the most. In the good times, you don't learn that. I don't think you learn that much. You learn when, you know, you got to deal with investors, you got to tell them bad news or you got to sure. deal with the banks or, yeah. you know, all that stuff that, um, yeah, that's, that's what makes you as a, as I think as a businessman is going through that tough stuff. Yeah. So that GFC, you know, when your phone's ringing, it was never going to be no, good news, never. but you had to answer it yeah. and you had to solve something, right? But I think what you just described was you use, you know, financial structuring, yeah. went back and put in a mess piece, raise more equity to ensure that the trade itself kept yeah. running, just trying to get investors a good outcome. Yeah. And then, you know, you held through and a lot of those did extremely well just because yeah. we... If we'd been forced to sell them, would have been in, you know, no good. But we we got through and had really good results for investors, which was good. Gotcha. And what letter lessons have mattered the most? Uh, um, well, the lesson we learned out of GFC was gearing, definitely. Yep. So ever since GFC, every fund, um, every new fund, you know, the leverage goes to the board for approval. Like even you know, fifteen years later. Um, so you know, we used to be geared at sixty with a sixty-five buffer. Now we get it. 40 to 45 with a 60 gotcha. percent buffer. So we've got massive buffers for anything to go wrong. Um, you know, and a, a lot of the guys that survived through that GFC taking that on, you know, yep. I think some of the newer, newer groups haven't, but they didn't go through it. But, um, you know, cause, cause gearing is a big part of real estate. Yep. That, that's what blows people up. Right. So sure. even though you can supercharge returns by upping that gearing, if it turns on you, you, you know, it, it can really affect the, the investment. So taking a bit less gearing and a bit less return uh, in the long run is probably the better way to go. It's probably helping you right now, right? Yeah. Interest it, rates it, going up and exactly. the lower gearing. Exactly. So, you know, I think our average gearing across our analysis funds sitting about 41, 42%, right? And you've got these big buffers, so we're not under stress there, which is gotcha. good. It's really good. What are some common misunderstandings about successful entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, look... Funny one, I, I was playing golf actually um, last week. I was in New Zealand and um, the 
team together, you know, my brother bought a mate along and I said, oh, we're about to start. And I said, oh, what do you play off? And he goes, I'm 0.7. It's pretty good. And, uh, and the guy, the other guy on the team goes, shit, I've never played with a, with a, um, mm. scratch golfer. And what he said is, it was kind of, he goes, it's not as pretty as you think. Yeah. And it was right, right. They hit it off, you know, they drive it. You know, they drive into the rough, they do this, mm. they do. but they have a way of getting back onto the green and round the green. They're perfect. Right? So I think that's a bit like a, the journey of a you know, entrepreneur or businessman is it's not just a upward line like that. Yeah. There's lots of ups and downs. And I think if you look at any, you know, the big, you know, billionaires around Australia, you know, there were times when they were nearly lost it all. Most of them. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, tech's a bit different. You know, a lot of tech guys, you know, gone. but, um, I think most businesses, it's a long grind and there's definitely ups and downs and every, every successful business person has had to have luck along the way. Yeah. You know, there's times when, you know, if you turn left instead of right, it could have blown something up, but you went that yeah. way, you went that way. So you need luck. Obviously you need to be, you know, you need to you know, have discipline and you can be a hard work and all the basic stuff. You need a bit of luck and you need to get through those ups and downs as well. Yeah, I think that's important. I mean, mm. you, you mentioned you know, sometimes you should have turned left, you'd turn right. Mm. What I've noticed a good entrepreneur is that regardless of the direction they turn, yeah. when they get there, they go, I'm there now. I've got, got to work out what to do, right? So yeah. I might have to turn right next time. And yeah, that's right. They just adapt along the way. So that yeah. makes sense. Um, so where do you see the most opportunity and risk today? Um, look, in, in real estate side of things, um, the risk side's all around rates, inflation, yep. You know, when will rates sort of stabilise? It looks like we're nearly there, but sure. it's looked like a few times. Yeah. Um, look, globally, I think, you know, if you look at Europe and the States, they pro probably are there. Australia's maybe a little bit behind. Um, I, in real estate, for, for the market to sort of settle down and get more positive sentiment, we really do need to see those rates peak. We don't even actually need to see them come off. I think yeah. peak, and then if they come off, that will be when the money's, when the, you know, the general equities guys flow back into into the REITs and, and other real estate companies. Um, so that's, look, that's the main risk. If you look at property as a property portfolio, like, you know, as I was saying, 430 buildings, we've got 3% vacancy. Like, yeah. um, our rares over the last six months are probably the lowest on record. Um, leasing's going really well, even in office, right? We're getting yeah. rental growth in some cities. Mm. So you read the papers and you think, you know, real estate is dire, particularly office. You, you know, if you read the AFR every day, you'd think every office building was half full. Yeah. yeah, it's not. It's it's our REIT. Twenty our REIT's got twenty five office buildings mm. around the country, three percent vacancy. Um, so it's not the property th stuff. It's more. It's definitely more the macro. Where we're seeing opportunity, the sectors we're seeing most opportunity in. Uh, we talked about um, real estate credit. So as the banks are tightening up, um, particularly for you know developers and smaller lenders. Um, there's huge opportunity in that space as you would have seen, you know, it's, you're getting really high quality lens, you're getting really attractive returns for your investors. Mm. Um, you know, we're putting products out at, you know, for first mortgages at 60% on quality property mm. with no construction risk and they're getting 10, 10 half percent. Sure. It's equity returns for, for debt really. So, um, we're seeing a lot there and you know, that business we we're talking about, you know, we, we bought it three years ago, had about $230 million of loans out the door and we're, you know, over one and a half billion now. So it's grown really quickly. So, um, that, that, that sector definitely. And look, industrial, yep. um, it's been one of the strongest se sectors since COVID. Um, we're in Australia, we've got the lo lowest vacancy in the world, right? So we've got less than 1% of vacancy. So basically every shed's full. Um, we're getting huge rental growth. So out of COVID came more demand for industrial. Yep. Um, so obviously, um, online retail in Australia is a laggard, you know, we're about, I think 12.8% of our retail is online. Look at something like UK is 26% wow, yeah. and online retail drives, you need sheds closer to the population to distribute the product. Mm. Um, so we're seeing huge rental growth. So if you look at our, our we've got 180 industrial assets in Australasia in our REIT, we've got 90, uh, all in Australia. At first half of 23, our releasing spreads, which means any leases that came up in that period, in that six months, when we release them either to a new tenant or the new lease to the existing tenant, the average releasing spreads were 19% for the first half of 23. Second half of 23 were 37%. Hmm. Last quarter were 48%. Wow. So if you were paying a million dollars a year rent and your lease came up, yep. basically you were paying one and a half million dollars the next day. So, and that's just lack of, lack of mm. supply, huge yep. demand. Um, and what we've concentrated in is infill. So infill being 
closer to the city, yep. smaller industrial facilities, not all the big, you know, not all the big, um, distribution centers out, you know, towards the second airport and, yeah. you know, Erskine Park that way. These are more where people need to distribute goods from and get to population mass quickly. Um, so there's not, there's no land there to build mm. new stuff sure. on. You can knock something down and build a multi-story warehouse. We're just starting to see, but the yeah. rents you need for that are very high because construction costs are so expensive. So look, there's still a lot of tailwinds in, in industrial. Uh, you've seen Amazon come to Australia over the last sort of Know, five years, um, put that in perspective. In, in the States, uh, they've got basically one square meter of industrial space per head of population. Gotcha. Okay? In Australia, they've got 0.15. Hmm. So you'll see their footprint double and probably double again over the next five years. So there's still, yeah, still a lot of demand to come in that sector as well. Yeah, there's no question that uh, segment of the market is, is relatively hot, right? Like yeah. a supply of land and, uh, and, and sort of buildings. That's right. Really. Uh, when you get like usually in a in any market, if you're under a five percent vacancy, it's a mm. really strong landlord market. So you're getting strong rental growth. Once you go under one percent, it's just ridiculous the, the growth. Yeah, gotcha. So, what are your tips for driving long term wealth? Could be even personal or it's yeah. Career, look, I think there's no quick you know get quick rich yeah. scheme. It it is a slow grind, right? Um, you know, it, it takes years to to accumulate mm. significant wealth. Um. You know, some will get lucky and bet in a tin bag or do something, you yeah, know, yeah. in tech stock. But long term, it's very hard, you know. Um, you see it with crypto, people piling yeah. in and, you know, talking about, you know, every taxi driver, my personal trainer would talk about me showing how much money he made every day and then all of a sudden it stopped and I've yeah. never heard about it again. So it's a grind. You've got to work through it. Um, you've got to learn your lessons. Like I think every, you know, along the way, there's always a lot of issues, as I said, Take a lesson out of every, every one and, and make sure you adapt that next time. Um, if you're in investments, not every investment goes right, yeah, you know. Um, but you've got to try and you know, mitigate as much risk as possible from learning lessons and 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 choosing the people you invest with. You know, if you sure. if you're as you know, if you're investing into you know, a manager a manager that's managing uh, investment for you. You know, you got to do your due diligence yeah. on the manager, right? It comes down to people and backing yeah. people, and not every. They might be a great person, but not always get it right. But at least, you know, someone with the right ethics, the right work work yeah. ethic. Um, you know, the smarts. Um, so yeah, it's 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 just there's no easy way there. It yeah. is a grind. I think it's that's a critical is that manager selection these days because there's new managers turning up, yeah. particularly in private credit. Yeah. Uh, in property and general private credit, and you really have to do a lot of due diligence. You've obviously got your Bass Centurion yeah. business, experienced guys building a great yeah. business, been doing it for a long time, right? So I can see why that business is successful. But then a lot of copycats turn up, yeah, right? And so investors right. really need to do their homework. You need understand. guys, you need managers or, or the people that have been through cycles, and yeah. you need a strong track record through those cycles. Now we can go to all our funds for 25 years. We've been through all those cycles and ups, downs, but mm. this is average returns really high, right? Um, you know, we see, I see real estate managers that came into the market in 2010. So they've just had a run like that for, yeah. you know, for 13 years till now, where it's just been up basically your cap rate compression and, mm. and then they show some really good returns. It's like, well, mm. you know, it's not quite the same as getting through this. So yeah, you want people with experience is, is the big thing. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please leave a review. It's really important to us. We're trying to build momentum around education and better reviews will get more people coming and listening. Can you share your top tips for those looking to uh, start a business? Um, yeah, look, um, it is obviously daunting yeah. doing it. I remember when John and I sort of went out and you don't know where the next dollar is going to come from and how you you know pay payroll. And um, Look, I think, you know, one big thing is reputation, right? Yeah. Especially if you want a long-term, you know, business career and build a good business. Um, you know, people get away with it. There's different people out there <laughs> that ethics are questionable and have done pretty well. But um, I think if you want a long-term, you, how you treat people, um, like in the, if you're handing other people's money, that that's just you've got to be straight down the line. You've got to mm -hmm. be so transparent with people. Um, you know, with investors, it, not everything goes right, as we've said, but investors don't like surprises yeah, so if sure. something's going off the rails go and explain it to them explain what you're going to do about it and 99 percent of them are fine okay mm -hmm. they understand as long as you know if you just come out one day and say this has gone wrong no you've lost mm -hmm. like they don't like that so being transparent to people um it's one thing in business and i've got a mate that's got a funds management company started 10 years ago and 
sort of, one of the things I said to him is, you know, at the start, he's just hiring the cheapest people he could hire, right? And you know, I've got this guy for, you know, 50 grand. I've got this guy. I said, mate, if you pay a bit extra and you get really quality people, and not necessarily, you know, more expensive people are high quality, but it supercharges your business. It makes your job easier. So if you get, if you get guys in there that really know, they, guys and girls that know what they're doing, um, and you got to pay a little bit more for them, it will come back in spades. Yeah, like it's sure. the quality of your team that you get around you. And it'll be a very small team to start, but as it grows, um, that makes probably the most difference to, to anything I've done as we've really hired up and got really good operators in the business. Mm -hmm. It's just, it takes a lot of, of uh, the work and stress and stuff off you. If you've got people that you can trust that yeah. they'll do something and sit, they won't do exactly how you do it, but as long as it's, you know, it's pretty similar, you can trust them with stuff. It takes a lot off your plate to concentrate on other things in the sure. business. Yeah. And people are critical. Yeah. Now, what do you do differently and why do you do what you do? Um, look, I don't know. I thought we sort of talked about a few of the things we yeah, do differently sure. as, as a business. Um, um, I think if I've got to point to one thing, it's, it is that culture piece. We do a yep. lot with our team. And as I see, we've picked everyone over the years and we do a lot of team building. We do a lot of events. We do a lot of celebrations. If we do a deal, you know, we'll put on a really good event for them. Mm. Something they don't usually get to do. We could, you know, to thank them for their hard work. And even in these, when it's a tougher environment, it might not be the Christmas party of five years ago, but it's still something to, to say thank you and try and build that loyalty. You know, if you have, if you have huge churn in your business, mm. one, it costs a lot, right? Yep. One, you got to, you know, obviously go find them, pay a recruiter, you know, then you got to train them. Then, yeah. you know, so it, it, it not just costs it, you know, it disrupts the business so yeah. much. So, you know, my view was, you know, spending an extra few bucks on an event or training or this, yeah. you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of that you can do for a 20,000 or 40,000 recruitment fee, right? Yeah, just yeah, to keep true. a few more people. So, you know, that's something we've really, invested yeah. in and i think you know if you speak to a lot of people in the real estate industry um i think that say centuria as a team and culturally and um i think we're a bit different to a lot of a lot yeah, of the others makes sense i know a lot of people that work mm. yeah in your business and they're good blokes yeah, they <laughs> which is important yeah. yeah i feel like property is one of those relationship industries right there's a lot of you're dealing with developers you're dealing with builders you're yeah. dealing with financiers it's very interpersonal so i can see culturally why that's important it is yeah um, and okay, just in either personal century again, what's your best investment you've done? Um, Centuria was, um, a, a, an office building actually in the city. So yep. a building called 10 Spring Street. So just down before, uh, Spring Hits Pit. Um, we bought this building, um, oh, it's probably about eight years ago now, 10 years ago. Um, we bought it, it was about 20% vacant. It was being sold by the um, owner occupier, which was a yeah. offshore big global group. Um, Twenty percent of the building hadn't been leased for a long time. It had a pretty average arcade running through it, through from Spring to O'Connell. Half the shops were empty, um, and the owner went to the agents and said, "You know, I want you to try and sell it." And he went out to a few people, just off market. They had a huge price on it. Um, we said, "Why don't even look at it too high?" Then they sold a big asset offshore. Um, the, the, owner, the agents came back and said, look, actually they've reduced it to this X level, but we're only allowed to go to three people. Okay. And they picked us as one and our rela agent relationships are really important for us and to others. And they said, best price on Wednesday gets the building. So anyway, we ended up buying for $91.6 million. So remember the number, um, bought the building. Everyone thought oh, paid a bit much. We thought not bad. And one thing we're good at is getting into buildings, you know, repositioning them, Doing the foyers, you know, the lifts, making them look prettier, uh, and then leasing. Leasing's our, our leasing team's really strong. Yeah. Um, so we got in there, we did the foyers, we did the arcade, we leased it all up, we got up to 100% leased. Um, and then, uh, so this was in about three and a half years, and it was a five-year farm, but we went to the invest and said, we think the time's to sell now, it's early, yep. we've, we've, we've added all the value, let's get out to the market. And um, we took it out to the market. Um, there was a logical buyer who owned quite a few sites around. It was a big group. Um, but, you know, we wanted to put some competition in there, make sure we had other bids to get the bid up. I think yeah. we'd got the valuation up to about 190 odd mil by then. So more than doubled in the three and a half years. Um, and we did have some luck as well. We had the, uh, if you remember back then, the government announced the Metro and they came in and they, they compulsory acquired a number of B grade yeah. office assets yep. in the city, which meant 
a lot of tenants were looking for space in that B grade. And so rents had a bit of a kick along. So that helped us as well. As well. Anyway, we wanted to get as many people into this, into the process as possible to really drive pressure on that logical buyer. Um, anyway, so we went out, we got five bids, we got offshore, onshore, we got privates. Um, it, it came in, you know, in the early 200s. By the time we'd finished, we got to 264 mil. Serious? Mm. Wow. So you got What was the purchase price? Again? 91, 91, 91 wow. in three and a half years. So, you know, a huge amount of, um, you know. Uh, wealth created to for the investors, you know, it was yeah, fantastic. Sure. So a lot of them more than tripled their money and, and they had a running return the whole way through of eight or nine percent as well. So yeah, that was a really good, you know, there's, there's quite quite a few of those sort of stories, but that was a big size, chunky one, which was good. So the problem yeah. with that one is investors turn up the next day and they want another one. Oh exactly. They're not that easy yeah, to find. No, right? another thing they're all like that, but uh yeah. yeah. And now on the other side of things, what's your worst trade? Worst investment? Um probably leading into the GFC. So um, you know, we were doing yeah, you know, we're doing just unlisted funds. As I say, we're gearing up to about sixty percent. We were buying a couple of bulky good centers, you know, large format retail, and um, we had well, we had a big advisory group that put a lot of money into. We had a diversified fund, and mm -hmm. they're putting a lot of money, and they hit twenty percent of the fund, and they said, "Look, um, we're only allowed to go to twenty percent of any fund, so we can't actually put any more money. But we've got more money to invest with you. You've done yeah. a great job. Why don't you get into? Yeah, you know, we, we had some." Um, bulky goods assets, why don't you combine a few of them, set up a fund and we'll come in and we'll take a cornerstone straight away. So we said, okay, so off we went and we put these assets together. We geared up to, to do it. Their capital was coming. GFC hit mm. and they pulled. And yeah. uh, so if, the gearing should have been 50, 45, 50. Day one, it was like 60 without the equity in there. And so it was just the wrong, the bad timing. But yeah, you know, we learned a big lesson out of that, yeah. uh, obviously. But um, yeah, that was hard. That was a three, four year grind to just get out of that, right? With with high gearing in a really tough environment. So yeah, as I said, learn a lot of lessons out of that one. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what qualities and character traits do you ever important for entrepreneurs? Um, obviously, Work ethic, you know, yep. you, you know, there's a lot, of, especially when you're starting, right? Or, or the whole way through, even as you grow, you think it'll be easing back, but it just gets harder. The problems are bigger, you know, sure. there's more people. There's more of them. So there's, there's, you never really ease back, I don't think. But um, you got to work bloody hard. Persistence, you know, you've yep. got to, there's times where it's, you're so close to, you know, giving up and, you know, everything's against you. And as I said, you know, as John told me years ago, it's darkest before the dawn. You know, yeah. you think it's, there's no way you're going to, get out of it. It's no way it's going to get better. And then it turns and you know, a lot of times it turns pretty quickly and a year later you're like, Gee, you know, what's happened in those 12 months. So yeah, I think that's a big one as well. Um, and then, you know, if you, as I said, if you want a long-term relationship, you know, your long-term business reputation, it's just how you treat people, yeah. your ethics, you know, you can't dud someone, you can't lie. Mm. You know, you got to be pretty transparent. So important in Australia. It's a small yeah. market in that sort of well-financed property. Everyone's pretty connected. Yeah. So you got to be careful how you behave. Uh, okay. A bit more of the personal side of things. What legacy are you living and leaving? Um, look, uh, obviously the business side, I, you know, it's great to build this big business and all the teams there yep. and the teams that will take over when, you know, John and I retire. So that hopefully doesn't get gobbled up by someone else and hopefully yeah. it survives, but uh, we'll see. Um, look, personally, um, look, oh, look, actually I've just had two, two kids. I'm, I was a bit yeah. late to the party, so I've got yeah. a, I've got a two year old and a two month year old. So, uh, that's a whole way of looking, different way of looking at legacy and, you know, going forward in life. So, you know, I'm turned 50 next year and to have young kids, it's, um, it's a bit different to all my mates and, you know, especially in New Zealand, I've got now got 25 year olds and things wow, running around. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, that the legacy, that side of growing up with it, you know, um, with them would be great. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a bit of a mix of the business side and the, yeah, and sure. the personal side. Good on you. No, that's good. So we need some quick fire questions, sure. sort of uh, short sharpies. Uh, what was your first job? Uh, working in the old man's meat factory as a 13 year old, I think. What do you have you doing? Mate, I worked 5am to 5pm every holiday. Seriously? It was bloody hard in a vacuum packing room. So you're in a room about this size. Yeah. It's all white, you know, the white walls. Mm. You're in white overalls, white um, boots, gloves, masks, hat. Um, and the hams, little hams would come out on a conveyor belt. You put them into the, the packaging bag. You had these machines, cryovac machines, and you put the neck in. You'd hold it. It's so loud as it sucked all the air out, slammed down, vacuum pack it and go along. And just did that Good for again. 12 hours a day. 
Yeah. Good on you. Sure, it's what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. What's a piece of advice for your younger self? Um, look, I think get outside your comfort zone. Like, I think the best decision I've made is move to Sydney, and it was a hard one. It was only going to be a year, and as I said, you know, those first six months were hard. I knew no one. Like, yeah. I'd sit at home on a weekend watching TV because I didn't know anyone. You know, and where I was working, I just couldn't meet people. So. I think get outside, push yourself, you know, travel, you know, move to a new place. Um, yeah, get those experiences and you'll work out what you want to do from there. Yeah, sounds good. What's the most important skill for building wealth and why? Uh, I think you've probably got to be dis disciplined, right? You can't, as I said, you can't look for that quick buck. You've just got to just be disciplined on the way through and you'll learn your lessons and you get more disciplined as you go, I think. Gotcha. What's the most important habit for building wealth and why? Um, there's a few, but I think getting out there, networking, meeting people, forming those relationships, you know, it's interesting where opportunities come from. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, some investments I've made outside property have come from just people I've met in relationships yeah. and relationships I've got on with and I've done very well. So, um, yeah, the more you can get out and make an effort to go, and that's where I met a lot of people, particularly in real estate is getting out to these property council, future directions forums which for younger yeah. people in property and things like that. And that's where I've met a lot of people I still know today yeah. from those sorts of things. Yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm a big one on that yeah. as well. You've got to be out and about in your yeah. industry. That's how you meet people. Definitely. Uh, what is your definition of sustainable success? Um, look, there's probably two parts. There's, you know, as a business, obviously you want to build a sustainable business, which means you know, you're mitigating risk, you're taking a lot of risk off the table, be that you know, debt levels, be it yeah. diversification. I think the two things we did on diversification side was obviously diversified in sectors, so seven different sectors, yep. um, but we diversified capital as well. So from coming from just high net worth investors, mm -hmm. we then went to retail investors um, uh, and then we went to institutional. So now we've got, you know, we've got BlackRock, we've got Morgan Stanley, we've got Sovereign Wealth Funds, Starwood invest with us. Wow, got you. So you've got the hot, full gambit. So if... If, you know, retail investors aren't investing at the moment, well, some of those institutes still want to, you know, buy yep. things. So diversification makes a sustainable business, I think. Yep, yeah, for sure. When you're not, you already mentioned golf, but when you're not working, how do you like to spend your time? Yeah, well, it's, these days a little bit more with the kids than yeah. it was. But, um, yeah, tennis, golf, you know, skiing, um, travel when I can. Um, yeah. Just being active. Yeah. What's the biggest mistake people make when it comes to building wealth? Oh, look, I think it's what I said before, looking for that, you know, fast money, yeah. you know, it, it might work once or twice, but in the long run, it just doesn't work. You know, you gotta, you gotta, it's slow and steady and you know, that's how, that's how you build it up. Perfect. Must do actions for investors? Um, look, I think, as I said, do your DD, like be it an investment or a man manager, just spend the extra time, just go and ask a few people about them, look at their track record see how long they've been around, what they've done, what cycles they've been through. Look, that doesn't mean it won't go wrong, but it, it does mitigate some of the risk. Brilliant. Appreciate you being in here today. No, thanks for having so me. So people who want to know more about Centuria, centuria.com.au, website, go and have a look around what they're up to. But I uh, really appreciate you, Jason, coming in. It's been a great chat. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Hey, if you're enjoying this, please leave a review. It's really important to us. We're trying to build momentum around education and better reviews will get more people coming and listening.